<clears throat> Guys, there's a lot of noise. But I, um, it's like, uh, you know, when you read through the prophets uh, in the Bible, God seems to talk about all this noise, but their hearts are far away from me. And he just keeps saying it over and over and over and over. <laughs> you know, when you read through the Gospels, I mean, when you read through the prophets, eventually you're like, God, we get it. I don't think we get it. There's no point of the noise. If there's no heart. If the heart is in the wrong place, if you're serving other idols, you're serving yourself, <clears throat> multiple masters, there's no point of the noise. I mean, it's, it's just all over the Bible. I'm not, you know, I'm not making something up here. You know, in Malachi 1.10, you know, God actually says, you know what, just shut the doors. You know, that, that actually exists. Just shut the doors. To what? The tabernacle, the temple. Why? Because all your sacrifices, they're half-hearted sacrifices. You're, all, you're giving me, what he says is, you're giving me your blind animals as a sacrifice. The animal that can't walk, that's what you're giving me as a sacrifice. Your leftovers. You do whatever you want to do and then give me your leftover. Your leftover time, your leftover of your life. You know what? Just shut the door. What do you think? God doesn't like see through this? Like we're smarter than God? That we could play him? That's, I mean, it's literally what I talked about yesterday, guys. Like, don't do this half thing. You're just wasting your time. Straight up the parable of the ten, ten virgins. The five, they got to the door. Jesus said, no, I don't know you. Well, no, they didn't get to enjoy the pleasures of the world. They didn't get to enjoy pleasures in heaven. That's a waste of time. See, so guys, um, you know, a lot of times when we talk about revival, we always say, oh, yeah, we were praying for our children, praying for the children. They need a revival. Uh, do you know why they need a revival? Who taught them? Who teaches children? Uh, if they need a revival... Parents need a revival first. See, I don't, I don't blame you guys. We came, you know, parents especially came to this country with nothing. They, you had to work hard to just live. I get it. But at some point, guys, I think we might have lost the bigger picture. And so now parents are, you know, just kind of living this like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Just, I'm, I just have to make it till I die and go to heaven. Yeah, that's not what the Bible teaches. Are you actively growing in your faith? Yes or no? Answer it for yourself. And then let your life be an example for your children. Let them see you go all in for him. Guess what, guys? They're watching. All right, so uh, yesterday... 
uh, you know, I talked about really this, you know, what I'm saying, living that all in life. But, you know, today I'm going to talk about a little bit going deeper into that path. Okay, uh, so one of the things, uh, let's actually start in John 15. We, we all know this passage. You don't even have to turn there. For most of the verses today, you could just look up here. Um, and I'm not even going to read the whole verse. John 15, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. All right, right there. If you stop right there, all of a sudden, just in that one line, it actually tells you one big purpose in life. Right, just, I haven't even finished the verse. I am the vine, you're the branches. Just by that, it gives you purpose in life. What do I mean by that? All right, well, let's say, I don't know, let me use a mic stand. This is a good, uh, can I, is there a good boom mic I can use? Oh, I got one, I got one. All right, guys, watch this. Let's pretend this is an apple tree, okay? So here is my... Here's our apple tree, okay? Here's the, the tree. Here's one branch on this apple tree. Here's another branch on this apple tree. All right, if, if I were to ask you, what is the entire purpose of this branch being here? What would you tell me the answer is? The entire purpose of this guy being alive, part of this tree, is to? I'm a drummer, so I can't hear. What is it? Yes, specifically what? Make an apple. If you're a branch part of an apple tree, I hope you're gonna at the one make an apple. There that's why later in the verse it says, well, if you're not making an apple, then let's cut you off. Okay, but we're not really gonna dwell on that. So if you're an apple tree and you're a branch on if there is an apple and you're a branch on the apple tree, you're saying your job is to make an apple. So then let's go back to if Jesus is saying, I am the vine, I am the tree, I'm the Jesus tree, and you are one of the branches on this Jesus tree, what is your purpose in life? It is to make a Jesus fruit. An apple tree makes an apple. A Jesus tree makes a Jesus. But, okay, I mean, just talking about the whole Jesus fruit concept, I mean, what is, what is the Jesus fruit? What are we actually supposed to produce? Maybe it's churches. Maybe we're supposed to make more churches. Well, obviously not, because in order to have churches, you need something else. You need people to come to the church, right? So, so okay, maybe not churches. Maybe the fruit that Jesus is talking about is Christians. Maybe we have to win souls. We have to go everywhere and, and win souls. You know what the problem with that is? Jesus walked with the disciples for three and a half years. He trained them, taught them, and finally they're starting to understand how Jesus thinks. Okay? At Matthew 28, the very end of the book, Jesus says, okay, now... Go make disciples. The end of this journey. A lot of times what we're doing is, oh, you're a Christian. Okay, now let's, tomorrow let's go out there and start winning souls to Christ. Hold on. Hold on. We need to be disciples first. Disciples, not whatever we're going to call it, right? Disciples of Jesus as defined by Scripture first. And I know we're all Christians here, but there's probably like five, hand, ten, whatever. There's probably a handful here that are actual disciples. Who knows? I'll let you guys decide. You have to be a disciple first. And then Jesus says at the end of the book, okay, now you guys, now that you learned, you've been through my school, now you make other copies of me. Okay? So what is this, going back to my original, what is this Jesus fruit? Well, where else, where else have we heard fruit in the Bible? Galatians 5, was it Galatians 5, uh, 22? The fruit of the Spirit is, see, we, we know this verse from the back of our heads, but 
Think about each one of these. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It's joy. Peace. Each one of these words are a big, big deal. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. See, guys, you know what this verse is actually talking about? That's Jesus. That whole list describes Jesus. Jesus is love. He is patient. He is the kind one. He is the prince of peace. That's talking about Jesus. That's why if you're going to be a branch on this Jesus tree, you're going to eventually bear a Jesus. You all start acting, talking, thinking like Jesus. That is the goal. But here's the problem. Each one of us have been given a physical body that has a mind of its own. Man, that thing is disgusting. Let me, uh, can I actually describe how disgusting your body is? Watch this. The same chapter, um, 519. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Watch this list. It's a long list. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry. That's a whole, like, you know, worshiping other idols. Sorcery, enmity, strife. This list just goes on and on and on. Jealousy. Sound familiar? Fits of anger. Rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, or just, and things like these. It's like the list is not even done at that point. And things like these. Guys, we're stuck in a very evil body. There's a fancy word called sanctification, which we always say in the church. Sanctification. What is sanctification really talking about? See, all this evil... That's just naturally, see guys, when, when I have a daughter, okay, I have two daughters, I never had to teach my kids how to lie. They're only six and three, you know, but I never had to teach them, hey, this is how you got to lie, right? They naturally lie. I had to discipline that out of them. That's exactly what we're talking about. By default, this is just disgusting. The goal for all of us, if we're going to choose to go on this path, all right, that's the premise here, is for basically there to be kind of like, a, what, like, a, like an exchange. You know, all this evil has to get out. The good has to come in. Fancy word, sanctification. All the bad, go. Good, good, comes back in. Does that, does that make sense? So uh, yesterday I was telling you guys I was going through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke. It took me three years to get to all that. You know, after that, I think this was two years, a year ago, something, I was really interested in Genesis. I wanted to start in the Old Testament now. And so I started in Genesis. I got up to the Israelites' journey, and I saw something really interesting. The journey of the Israelites is kind of like a road map for our lives. Watch this. Uh, whoever there was there last night talked about Egypt. What does Egypt represent? Bondage. So coming out of Egypt, right? Israelites coming out of Egypt through the Red Sea. It's this whole sanctification, I mean, sorry, salvation idea. Coming out of bondage through the Red Sea into the wilderness where they're alone with God. Now they cross the Jordan River and now they're told, okay, when you cross the Jordan, get rid of all the enemies in this land. But guys, in the wilderness, there was no enemies to get out of the land like that. 
The main focus of the wilderness was actually them, getting rid of the evil in them, testing them, you know, giving them good kind of trials to like really build their character. I saw that this whole wilderness journey was kind of like a picture of sanctification. And you know, I'm, I'm, I, I was driving and um, I drive a truck for a living. And I remember I was praying, you know, I was like, Lord, I, I see what you're teaching me here, but um, is there something in me that like you're seeing that's not really, you know, sanctified? <laughs> is there something in me that's off? Like, I'm not murdering people, I'm not committing adultery, so, you know, like the obvious ones, you know, I checked off that list, but maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm doing something that I don't even know that I'm doing, you know? So, I, I, you know, I'm driving, and, you know, I ask the Lord, you know, can you show me what that is? Let me explain to you what I actually do for work. Um, for work, I actually have a shipping business, um, and I drive a truck. I can drive an 18-wheeler, but for what I do, I just drive a, you know, like a Penske, like a box truck. I live in Houston, go from Houston to Chicago, drive to Boston, drive to Florida, and back to Texas. It's a two and a half week trip, takes 8,000 miles, um, and then I take about a month off after that. I, the funny thing is I'm actually in the middle of a trip right now. Uh, I was doing this whole thing and I got up to Florida and then I had to fly out to come here. Uh, and then I'm going to fly back to Florida tonight and then finish it. But anyway, that's what I do. I ship furniture, mainly antique furniture, you know. Um, and so I, I heard there's a few tr truck drivers in the room. Any, any truck drivers? I heard pastor said, oh, there we go. Nice. My brother. <laughs> so guys, in the world of trucking and in the world of commercial driving, we have this thing called a log book, okay? Basically, our phone actually connects through a device into the truck, and this thing tracks everything. Now, here's how it works. We're given a, we're given a window, a 14-hour window, okay? If I start my day at eight o'clock in the morning, I have a 14-hour shift. Now, within this 14-hour shift, I can drive up to 11 hours, anywhere within the shift, okay? The other three hours, I could just hang out, you know, I could fill gas, whatever. But I just can't be driving. After this 14-hour shift, then I have to take a 10-hour break. Then this whole pattern resets. Another 14-hour shift, okay? That's just the rules. There's this one exception. If you need to get lunch, what you can do is that you can check off this box that says personal driving. They call it personal conveyance. Just personal driving. So, you know, if you need to look, and it doesn't count against your driving time. So you could, you know, you could just use it whenever. I got to New York. My parents live in New York. Um, I had to do a delivery in Connecticut. It was 137 miles away. What happened was I booked I scheduled it with my client. I said, okay, uh, ma'am, I'll be there tomorrow, you know, two o'clock. She said, okay. I scheduled it. Then I looked at my log book and I realized, oh man, I don't have enough time in my shift to actually get there. So guess what I did? The next day came, I had to make the delivery, so I just uh, checked off personal conveyance and just drove all the way to Connecticut. I drove to Connecticut, didn't get struck by lightning, finished the delivery, you know, came back home. Three days later, I'm driving from Boston down to Maryland. You know, I'm driving all the way back home down to Florida, but I got up to Maryland. And you guys ever seen those way stations? On the side of the highway, it says way station. So that's actually a, like an actual scale. Like trucks have to pull up on, the, on a weight scale and it weighs how much this truck weighs. They don't want trucks to be driving unsafe, so they check that. But sometimes they have police there also who will do a full inspection on your business. I mean, they'll check your tires, brakes, everything on your truck. You know, they'll check your logbook, make sure that's all good. 
They check everything. It's a full inspection. I got to Maryland, pulled into a way station, and then got pulled over into it. It's very random. You know, they'll randomly pull you over. Got pulled into a way station, uh, into an inspection. Two cops. And, um, you know, <laughs> uh, it's an older cop and a rookie cop. The rookie cop checks my entire truck. Truck is brand new, it's flawless, you know, so truck passed. I'm sitting there just waiting for the other guy, and all of a sudden, I see his hand out the window. He's like, <laughs> so, oh. so, you know, I got out of my truck, walked to, walked to his car. I was like, yeah, officer, and he's like, hey, so, you know, your truck looks good, all that's good, um, you know, but there's one thing. I see that um, you're doing a lot of personal driving, and I was like, well, and it's straight up truth. I was like, I mean, I, my parents live in Mineola, so if you see, you know, in New York, if you see any driving around there, that's all, you know, it's all personal. He's like, oh, okay, okay. Okay. But there is this one trip that you did for 137 miles all the way to Connecticut. Yeah, officer, that wasn't personal. I'm looking at him, he's looking at the other officer, other officer looking at me. Awkward silence. You can cut the tension with a knife. He's like, do you understand how serious of a violation that is? I was like, no, I, I really don't. And he's like, do you know that if you were to get into an accident, a lawyer would look at this and say you weren't driving enough or you weren't sleeping enough and you can get arrested for manslaughter if somebody dies? I was like, whoa, <laughs> that just got real. I didn't know that. <laughs> Another awkward silence. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that's the truth, officer. So awkward. And then I just slowly walked back to my truck. I mean, what are, you know, what are you going to do at that point, right? I walked back to my truck, guys, and then all of a sudden, it hit me. It just hit me. Remember a few days ago, I specifically asked the Lord, show me an area in my life where I am not sanctified. This was the prayer answered. Burley, you're lying. You're lying. You're lying. I was so filled with joy, you had no idea. I was like, God, you're speaking to me. <laughs> That's what this whole thing is about? You just wanted to show me that what I was doing wrong so I could be better and look more like you? Oh my goodness, what? I was so excited. Uh, and at the same time, this true godly sorrow came into me. Of like, wow, I've been doing this for a while now. I didn't even realize I was doing it. But I was lying. And a true, a true sorrow came in me. And I was just saying, sorry, Lord, I am so sorry. I had no idea. You know, I had no idea. <laughs> I didn't even think this mattered. I had no idea. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. True, true, like, repentance, you know? And then I just kind of, like, snapped back into, like, okay, hold on. This guy's about to give me whatever ticket he wants to give me. So, like, you know, when you're a good parent, you're always, like, you, when your kid learns a lesson, he learned a lesson, right? Like, no point of giving him another idea if he got the, he, he get it. I was like, God, I get what you're trying to teach me. I get it, I get it, I get it. Um, but right now, this guy's about to give me whatever ticket he wants. Can you please show me some earthly mercy? Like, you know, I, I, I understand the spiritual lesson, but can you just please spare me this? And, uh, you know, I just prayed that prayer. The officer comes. He's like, hey, man, so we are going to give you a ticket, you know, uh, falsifying a log, that's a big deal. We're going to give you a ticket. 
Um, but my other guy here, he said, um, don't give him a fine. I was like, oh. <laughs> so they didn't give me a fine. You know, that night I, I was in my hotel and um, I looked up what is the fine for this falsifying a log. It's a minimum of a $7,000 fine. <sighs> See guys, two things. First of all, when I was driving to Connecticut, I felt it. I felt the Holy Spirit say, hey, hey. I mean, it was a super quiet voice, you know. But I felt him say, hey, you're doing something wrong. What did I do? Yeah, but my work is more important. So sh 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 let me just finish this work. You know, the other funny thing is, I'm not a liar. Like, like if you know me, my, if you ask my wife, he, she wouldn't say, oh, yeah, my brother just lies all the time. I'm like, that's not me. I'm actually very honest. I mean, you, you've, you've seen my honesty here, right? I'm just, I'm just going to tell you as it is. And so I would have never, ever called myself that was a sin that I was struggling with, you know? Like, but see, that's the thing, guys. God saw a little, little speck of lying in me. He's like, you know what? I don't even like that speck. You see how sensitive God is toward the little, little sins? Let me just read a few verses. Numbers 19, verse 2. Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without spot in which there is no blemish. Guys, do you know how hard that is? I don't know if you've ever done the research. A red heifer, a heifer is a female cow, never given birth. But do you know how hard it is to find a red one that has no white hairs? That's a project. That's a big deal. But you see what God is trying to say. Before Passover, remember the Jews? They had to clean, clean the house. Clean the house. Same idea. God does not want a hint of sin. Second Peter 3 verse 14, it says, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. Be diligent, like really try to be found without spot or blemish. And this is my favorite. You know how everybody's always asking like, Lord, I just want to do your will. I just want to do your will. Uh, <laughs> First Thessalonians, 4, 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. This is God's will. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know how much more clear it gets than that. See, maybe it's not lying for you. Maybe it's lust. Maybe you could just get angry. Oh, it's, I, you know, I just get a little bit angry, you know, sometimes my kids. Maybe there's a little bit of jealousy a little bit of bitterness towards somebody. Hey, let me help you. There's no place for that. God doesn't want even that little bit. You know, it's, I don't know how it is here. I actually don't know. But like, in, I've been part of Indian church my whole life. Man, there's always gossip. There's always a few people who want to gossip. Guys, I don't know if you missed that word in, in, in the Bible, but gossip is part of that same list that says, don't do this. It's part of that same list. Don't do it. It's sin. If you want to talk about somebody, encourage them to their face. One of the biggest excuses you hear, oh, but God understands. You know, I'll tell you what God understands. He actually wrote it all in the Bible. <laughs> Imagine that. He wrote everything the Bible said. This is what I understand. Now you read it. If you don't want to read it and you want to just make the excuse, oh, but I'm struggling with what I want to struggle with and God will understand, uh, then you're kind of following what you want to do. I'm a human. Yeah. He asked you to die to that. 
That was a whole die to flesh, crucify your flesh. Yeah, we know your human part. Nobody likes it. Get rid of it. I was asked a question, um, you know, we always hear people ask, like, um, you know, there's grace, so we could sin, right? There's grace? Uh, uh, no. Why? Because Jesus said, my mother, my brother, my sisters are those who do my will. And we just read the will of God is sanctification. If you're saying you're following Jesus... See, by definition, that means you are running away from sin. That is the definition of following Jesus. Jesus, sin, two opposites. If you're saying, yeah, I'm following sin, but there's grace for me. I mean, I'm following Jesus, but there's, there's grace for me to sin too, right? No, that doesn't make any sense. If you're an actual Christian, by definition, there is no room for, oh, but let me also do a little bit of sin. That it just doesn't make sense. I'm not talking about like, oh, I slipped. No, no, no. We all slip. I'm talking about just, you are intentionally, blatantly, knowingly sinning. That's on you. I'm going to close. Um... You know, I, I, in closing, I'm just going to say three things. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, when you hear a message like this, you'll think, okay, you know what? I have to change. Good. So now I have to really practice not getting mad. Okay. Here's a problem, guys. You're trying to do it in your own physical power. But remember, the Bible says, no, it's actually not by your power. It's not by your strength, but it's only by His Spirit. So if you guys try to do it without the Holy Spirit, you're going to fail. Sanctification only through His Spirit. I'll also say, this is a, oh man. I'll also say, the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you if you ask Him. But sometimes He actually asks the brothers and sisters to tell you. Sometimes it's the brothers and sisters' job to tell you, hey, I see something that's not lining up with the Word. Now, in our culture today, everybody's a little too, ooh, too sensitive. You can't say anything to hurt it. I mean, I might as well get sued at this point. Guys, grow up. Get some thicker skin. See, you can only see through your two eyes looking front. I have all these guys that can see all angles of me. They can have a much better picture of what you look like. Let them pour into you. Be open to correction. If you're not open to correction, you know what that's called? That's pride. I'm good. I can take care of myself. I don't need anyone to tell me how to... Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's pride. Let's call it what it is. That's pride. But if you can be humble and say, hey, any of my brothers, any of my brothers, if you guys can see anything fault in me, pastor, if you see a fault in me, call it out. I'm just trying to become like Christ. Somebody help me out. That is a great, humble posture to be in. The final, final thing I'll say is, you know, what's the point of all this? Why are we transforming? Well, remember, we're the bride of Christ. If we're the bride, do you really want Jesus, the love of his life, to have all this dirt on her? If you truly love Jesus, you would want to offer him up just a perfect, beautiful sacrifice. It's just out of love. Therefore, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy, holy, and acceptable to God. This is your actual act of Ooh, worship. This is your actual act of worship.
That is your actual act of worship. So, yeah, sure, we can sing some songs right now. You can call it what you want. But the Bible defines the actual act of worship as what you're going to do the rest of this week. Let's, uh, we'll sing some songs and worship the Lord.